Welcome to Module 7, Evidence of a Beginning of the Universe from Space-Time Geometry. This is the seventh module in a 12-module series entitled God and Modern Physics. It is presented by Father Robert J. Spitzer of the Maja Center of Reason and Faith, and it is based on his recently released book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. Welcome to the Maja Center of Reason and Faith series, God and Modern Physics. I'm Father Robert Spitzer, and we've been talking about evidence for the existence of a creator, supernatural design, the evidence of God that comes from contemporary physics and astrophysics. We've been specifically talking about uh, the evidence for a beginning of the universe that comes from entropy, if you can see from our diagram. And now we've moved on to the area of evidence that comes from space-time geometry. And specifically, right now, we're looking at the evidence for a singularity. Remember that a singularity is a point when all of space-time is, is collapsed into something like 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, or perhaps even smaller, the entire universe is, is collapsed in this very small part and, point and then expands or explodes from that point. Now, the key thing is you can actually prove the necessity of a singularity. And we saw in the last episode that Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose made such a proof with five conditions, but they really didn't account for dark energy. And, and since they wrote their proof, uh, of course, there was a discovery of dark energy, and, and so their proof was violated. Third condition of their proof was violated, and so it seemed for a second there that there wasn't a need for a singularity. But then we just saw uh, that two uh, other uh, physicists, Arvind Borda and Alexander Vilenkin, um, come up with a second proof, and um, this does consider dark energy that causes the inflationary condition. And what they discovered was that in all inflationary model universes, uh, there would also, if, if those universes met five specific conditions, there would have to be once again a singularity, a literal beginning point, a beginning point prior to which there was no physical event, a beginning point at which the universe came into existence. Now, in 1997, they discovered another possible exception to this, a weak energy condition. Uh, and the weak energy condition, though, was a highly, 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 highly improbable event that our particular universe could have actually experienced. Nevertheless, that weak energy condition uh, did present at least a, a loophole, a way of getting out of the very formal proof that Borda and Villenkin had put together. People did not think, though, that this invalidated the proof itself, and so even uh, per, uh, you know, most physicists, including Alan Guth, just said this is not a significant enough exception uh, to, to really invalidate the proof of, of Borda and Villenkin. And so currently, just from the 1993 proof, we have a highly probable occurrence of a singularity, that is to say a beginning point at which the universe came into existence, proven by the uh, borda villenkin proof in, in five conditions. Then in 1999, uh, Alan Guth, <clears throat> an American cosmologist um, uh, at MIT, <clears throat> actually did a kind of an, an assessment of all of the various mathematical modeling that had been done of inflationary model universes. And what he discovered after all of this, he said, try as physicists have to, to, to get out of a beginning of an inflationary model universe they have been unsuccessful to date. Every single model of an inflationary uh, universe requires a beginning. It can't, the universe can't be eternal into the past uh, out of the dynamics of space-time geometry. So this second piece of evidence is collating with the Board of Villenkin 1993 proof. But then in 2003, all three of them got together. 
In other words, uh, Borda and Villenkin came together with Alan Guth and they discovered what is now called the borda villenkin guth or the BVG theorem. Now, the BVG theorem from 2003, uh, there have been many physicists who have tried to find exceptions to this proof, but no exceptions to date have been found. Uh, this is a remarkable proof, and it's very, very elegant. And let me just give you for a moment the, the, the basics of the proof itself, and then we'll talk about, okay, its unbelievable applicability, and then its ability to predict a, a beginning of our universe under any kind of scenario that one might wish. So what's the idea behind the proof? The idea is that relative velocities in the universe are always going to get smaller and smaller if the universe itself is expanding. <clears throat> Even if the universe is expanding at a very, very minuscule rate, and by the way, the universe is not expanding at a minuscule, the universe is expanding at a very rapid rate. But the key thought, of course, is even if the universe is expanding at a minuscule rate, relative velocities in the universe are going to decrease. And why is that? Well, Villenkin gives the idea of a, 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 a space traveler zooming by the Earth at 100,000 uh, uh, kilometers per second. And, and let's suppose that the galaxies in expanding space are expanding, uh, that is to say, moving away, because everything's moving away from everything else, remember, so that the galaxies are moving away at maybe 20,000 miles per second, then the observers on the planet uh, or in the galaxy where the space traveler is going to will see the space traveler coming at a relative velocity of 80,000 uh, kilometers per second, that is to say 100,000 kilometers per second minus 20,000 uh, kilometers per second. So as you go into the future in an expanding universe, relative velocities will be getting smaller and smaller. So says Villenkin, as you or Guth, as you go back into the past, as you then get further and further into the past, then the relative velocities would have to be getting greater and greater. And eventually, one will arbitrarily approach the speed of light. And you're not going to get faster than that. And so that constitutes a boundary to pass time. You cannot get any further than that because your velocities in the past would be higher than the speed of, relative velocities would be higher than the speed of light. Now, the interesting thing about that theory is it applies to any possible universal condition. Really, the physics of the universe doesn't matter. So you can apply it to higher dimensional space. You can per, uh, apply it to string theoretical higher dimensional space with membranes colliding against membranes. You can apply it to bouncing universes. You can apply it to multiverses. You don't need Einstein's theory of gravity. You don't need uh, you know, any specific physics. The only, only condition that has to be met is one single condition, that the average Hubble expansion, that is to say, that the average rate of expansion of the universe be greater than zero. Now, since our universe is expanding, that's going to be a highly, highly, highly probable condition for not only our universe in its expansion, but any previous period that is attached to our universe, and as we'll see, will certainly have to be the condition of any multiverse. So in other words, the great part about the BVG theorem is that it is almost universally applicable. One single condition. It can apply to virtually every condition of a pre-Big Bang universe or a bouncing universe or a multiverse. The universality of the condition knocks down practically all of the alternatives that can be uh, given uh, to replace it. So the one thought that we have then is, with this particular proof substantiating the Board of Villenkin 1993 proof and substantiating Goose assessment of all of the mathematical modeling that had previously been done requiring a beginning, there is now a very strong probability 
of a beginning of the universe established by space-time geometry. More on this later. To learn more about this series and the Magis Center of Reason and Faith, please visit www.magisreasonfaith.org. That is www.magisreasonfaith.org. You may purchase Father Spitzer's book on this subject, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy, on the website or through Amazon.com.